Hey guys, um, I don't always get invited to just talk, but we're going to do this. So uh, uh, most recently, me and my wife, Michelle, um, made our most recent counterintuitive decision. We moved back to Muncie, Indiana from Portland, Oregon, where we'd been living for almost a decade um, in a spot that kind of spoke all of my natural aesthetic love languages you know, with skateboarding and music and beautiful scenery and culture, but something um, almost 10 years in was withering. On paper, our life for an independent musician looked really, really great. Had four kids, bought an old 1911 Foursquare in the urban core, built a fan-funded studio in the backyard, uh, no shortage of opportunities, but something inside was withering and I had to make sense of what that was. Um, took me a while, you know. At first it was just, I just need some distance from being in the city. But we found our way all the way back to Muncie, Indiana, which is where I came to the faith, where I made my first few albums in an upper bedroom where I lived with 14 other interns at our church, where I made a $25 a week stipend, uh, cleaning toilets and learning about New Testament and Old Testament and hermeneutics and homiletics. Um, but we found our way back there to Muncie, Indiana, of all strange places. When I knew it was time to go, I knew the Midwest was calling me back. Somehow it, it runs in my blood. I was born outside of Detroit and grew up in South Bend, Indiana. And I knew I needed to come back to remember something, uh, to draw something to the surface again. Somehow, inwardly, my storyline had just subtly lost track, just subtly gone off a little bit. Um, over the years, I think having maybe, I don't want to call it an artistic temperament, but I definitely am impressed by um, certain images or themes that'll come up over and over um, in scripture just in life circumstances. Things will, things will pop up and that part of your mind, that part of your heart, that part of your soul and spirit that knows this is important, pay attention, and you journal that thing down. Those become themes and eventually values that inform the direction your life is going. And this is obvious, you know, the things we think upon, the things we desire motivate us. We make real life decisions to move towards that end. Um, but as the guys before me were stating, if the end is not worthy of your time, just being rich and famous is not worthy of your pursuits. It's not. I'm in a business where to have a hit song in this day and age is to like hit the lottery and you can become instant royalty, the next Post Malone or whatever, known your household name and lots of money, lots of attention. But if that's the pursuit on the front end, you see in music, just the wake of men and women who have destroyed their lives. They didn't have the strength to hold what had been given to them on the fast track to that success, you know? And those of you in the business world, I'm sure you've seen it too. I've rubbed shoulders with just enough millionaire billionaires to see, oh man, if it was just about getting here, your life is vacant and this has no meaning. You know, it was King Solomon that says, vanity, vanity, all is vanity, when he has everything in the world and supposedly the wisdom to manage it. So, in my life from the very beginning, I came to faith a little bit later in life as a 20-something out of a background of drugs and skateboarding and punk rock and hip-hop and still getting good grades and smiling at your mom and shaking your dad's hand, you know but came to faith and immediately there were prayers put into my life. One was, Lord, help me end well, because I know that I don't have the ability to do that on my own. Um, and he would bring themes into my life. I knew there were sounds put in me. I don't know how else to put it, but I knew there were colors and sounds that were in me that it was gonna take a lifetime for me to explore and see how those interact with each other and make music. And I'll give it away, like from the very beginning I had a deep internal sense that there's a possibility within this field, within making music in tandem with following the Lord in faith that has the ability to do things. You see precedent for it in scripture. 
You see precedent happening around us right now that within the realm of a song, someone could write a song and overnight that song could wrap the globe in billions of people's smartphones and incite riots. It could incite revival. That's a potential within the realm of music. And so even as a 20-year-old in Muncie, Indiana, up in a bedroom making music with a cheap mic, a cheap guitar, there was this sense of there's real possibility here. There's real possibility with these few tools that I've been given. I know I've been given this voice and a hunger and a pursuit to hunt for what's possible. And in that time, as I was wet cement as a new believer, he put certain themes in my life. As I said, one was to end well. Another one was this image of the still small voice. As you know, the prophet, it's Elijah, yeah, Ja or Sha, Ja, Ja, yeah. You know, he has this epic showdown with the prophets of Baal. God shows up, consumes the altar with fire, and then he runs for his life from Jezebel. He hides in a cave. He thinks he's the only true one left. I'm the only one who follows you, Lord. And he's waiting for an interaction from God, the Almighty, to speak to him, to give him direction, to comfort him, to counsel him, to strengthen him all the things that he knows God can be. But the perplexing part of that story is he goes to the mouth of the cave, those of you who know the story, and the wind whips by and the Lord's not in the wind. The ground shakes, the Lord's not in the earthquake. The storms come, the fire, the Lord's not in any of these really loud sensory experiences. When all that passes, the Lord comes with a still, small voice and that changes everything for Elijah. And at the beginning of my pursuit in music, he let me know, you're entering a field here, an industry that is built upon loudness. But if I give you even the smallest word, I could give you the simplest melody, and if that's put together in tandem with me, it can change things. So within the music field, do we have anyone who does music here? That guy. <laughs> Do any of you guys like classical music? All right, a few more hands, yeah. So if you've ever had this experience listening to classical music in a car, really, you need to listen to classical music at home in a quiet room with a hi-fi set. You know why? Because there's huge peaks and troughs in the sound. There's like boisterous, loud, triumphant parts that just as quickly sink down to, you know, a feather of some violins. And when you're in a nice room with a nice hi-fi, that's a delightful experience to sit back and you set aside that time and you take it in. Have you ever tried to listen to classical music in a car going 70 miles an hour? That quiet part comes and you can't hear it, so you turn it up, and then all of a sudden the boisterous part comes and you're like totally jarred with bleeding eardrums because it was so loud that the noise around you was drowning out the quiet parts. The noise around you was drowning out the quiet, most sensitive parts. And so within the music industry, for years and years and years, there's been this battle called the loudness wars. Interesting, we're talking about threshold. Um, how you make music louder so that there's not these huge peaks and troughs is you use what's called a compressor. What a compressor does is it takes the loudest parts and it, it like compresses them, makes them smaller. So then you can turn the overall volume up and then the quiet parts get louder. And you can compress something to the point where if you look at the wave file, it's just one solid block. So any, any song you listen to on the radio, if you were to drop the wave file where you can like see how loud and soft it is, all you'll see in the computer is one solid block. When he's singing the quiet part, it's just as loud as the loud part. And we wonder why sometimes we get ear exhaustion Within music engineering, that's called ear exhaustion. There's no contrast. But in an industry, they started those because on the radio, you don't want to switch stations and have them trying to turn up to hear you. You want to be the most present. You want to be the loudest thing happening. And so that's been in the music industry forever. Everyone trying to compress their music to make it louder and louder and louder and louder and louder so they can be louder than the next guy so that they can be heard. 
but it reaches a point where there ceases to be any feeling. There might have been feeling in that song at one point, but so many hands got on it and they tried to prep it for the industry and it just strangled it. And the song, and the song died and it doesn't move people as it might have. It's so sad to meet young musicians who are almost in tears over their first album because they paid a lot of money to go into a studio, to have some engineer that cares nothing for their work just slap compressors on it. So he told me, the small voice, the still small voice, pay attention to that. Over the years I've had to fight for space to tune in to, to that still small voice in a time period that's louder than it was even when I began in the early 2000s. Um, I know this gets belabored a lot, but man, social media has, is a whole loudness war of its own. Um, influencer as a career is a whole loudness war of its own. To where there ceases to be differentiation between the subtleties and the nuances and the most tender things in life and the loudest things in life. The crises and those things that are not at all a crisis, but are built up to be one, and it leaves us confused. In the past year, I've had two good friends, both musicians, if you'd meet these guys, you'd think, you know, they got long hair, and they're like bohemian, and you just think like, oh, they're living the dream, making music, you know, easygoing guys. It's working for them. Both of them have had to go to the hospital thinking they were dying because they were having anxiety attacks. They didn't know what it was thought they were having a heart attack and dying. These are just musicians in Indiana. Part of my move from Portland was I reached a successful point in my career and I started having physical ailments. It was like getting numb in my fingertips and tightness in my chest and trouble breathing and my thoughts weren't clicking right and this seemingly um, endless reservoir of creativity that had always been there. I was like, man, I don't have enough time in life to like fully let all these ideas blossom. It's endless. I found myself like scraping the bottom of the barrel and wondering what happened? Where did I go wrong, you know? So this pilgrimage, strange, instinctive pilgrimage, we made our way back to Indiana, where I think part of the reason I got invited to be here, I think, is because Arian Armstrong, who goes to church here, um, read, a, read a post I did on Instagram, which I don't tend to do like super heartfelt, angsty posts. <laughs> At least I don't want to make a practice of it, you know? Because I feel like it gets drowned out, once again. I feel like that's a soundbite place that I can share the deepest part of my soul and it, it's right next to a meme, you know? Um, but I shared with people who, who cared to read that I was getting ready to release an album, but this is the first time in my music career that I'm doing so from a healthy place where I don't feel like I'm breaking down mentally, physically, emotionally because um, I had all these years of hunger, and it's good to work. It's good to work. I'll, I'll stress that, that when he puts something in us, we put our hand to the plow, and we begin to move in that direction, even if it's baby steps, and it's hard to get the inertia. But at some point, I think I lost track of the, the still small voice. I lost track of the peace that I was supposed to carry through it, you know? I'd have these times of interaction with the Father, and then I would take maybe the word given, and then close the door, and then go about my work for an entire work day or a week, and then turn around and say, did you see this? What do you think? Can you bless it, man, <laughs> you know? And that, I didn't realize it, but that was sort of the rhythm I was in. Okay, I had my powwow with God over here. It was so meaningful. He said things to me. He loves me. And then kind of like close the door to that part of your life, and then enter into real life, which is... Okay, I gotta get this done, I got time frames, I got people on a payroll, I got a tour coming up, I have this opportunity, you know? And then that was part of leading me into crises. So our time back in Indiana initiated us entering into a time that I would, I would like to call like a season of relative like hiddenness, 
where he's been building something beneath the surface. We're becoming like pregnant with vision in this time for me and my wife. But what it looked like during this past year is learning to wake up early, which I'm not a morning person, but I have five kids. So if I want any time to myself, I have to wake up early. Wake up at 5.30 in the morning, have a cup of tea, read some devotionals, and then I get in my car and I drive around rural Indiana from anywhere from an hour and a half, depending on the day. I have a really wonderful wife. She just tells me, take the time you need. It's part of your job. I'm like, thank you. Um, sometimes I'll drive around for five hours, eight hours. No music on. Um, rarely a teaching or a podcast, and I just watch the landscape go by. I look out over open plains, depending on the time of year. It's green or it's brown or it's covered with snow. And I allow myself to talk with him and have um, time in his presence. I've learned in my case, I do my best thinking when I'm moving. It's hard for me to be in a room and just stare at a wall. It's hard for me even to just get on my knees and stay in that position talking to God. But getting out, getting a cup of coffee, and moving, driving around forgotten, desolate roads and asking questions. And inevitably, I've heard about people in the past that could spend these ridiculous amounts of time just sort of like in his presence or pray at all times. That always sounded like a pipe dream, like fantasy, you know? But what happened there is he does speak. Now I've learned to keep driving until I feel like he brings something, until I sense the peace of God fill my heart. But what happens, here's, so this is like testimony. What happened this past year is I was working on this album, 15 songs, which is a longer form album, means there's a lot of work involved. And I finished on time, and it was enjoyable. And I didn't throw myself into like emotional, physical breakdown. So that, that happened. <laughs> and it was an important, it was an important time of learning something new about this, you know, because I've, as I've said, I've had these themes that come up in my life, but this was, this was something new for me. Um, to learn that our time with him, I actually accomplished more, faster, and in a way where I felt like I was in my stride and enjoying the thing again. So I don't know if I'm speaking to anyone here who actually is in business, and you've reached a point where it's successful, but you're disillusioned and maybe you're burned out on it. The good news is that's your moment of crisis or threshold. I reached a point where when I looked at making an album at the beginning of this last year, I told my wife, if it looks like it has up to this point, I never want to do it again. I love making music, but if it looks the way it's looked, I don't want to do it. I don't want to do that anymore, anymore, anymore. And it's perplexing and what you've done seems to be successful or even has meaning attached to it. I'm not ashamed of any of the stories or songwriting that I've put into that work. But somehow my process had become contorted. And I had to figure out how to get back to the heart of things. So I had a bunch of other things I thought I was gonna say, but I think I'm just gonna camp out on this one if that's all right. I knew it was all in me. I just didn't know how it was going to come out, but th th here we are, you know? <laughs> so there is, if you're here and you're in the dreaming phase of entering into something new, starting a new venture, starting a new creative endeavor, you're going to have to find the values the themes that God is putting into your life because they're going to help you navigate into that so that when crisis moments come, they're going to help you figure out how to move through it. But then if you've been obedient and walked with that thing for a number of years, five, ten years, and you're beginning to see the fruit of your labors, I think here's the interesting thing that maybe some of the older folks would agree with is that there's a season of obscurity and there's a season of hunger and there's a season of dreaming and of small things. And that's a beautiful time. I learned to thrive there. But then when I entered into the season of harvest, the season of 
blossoming, the, the work that I'd put in for many years bearing fruit, that's a different place, but the values stay the same in that place. He was my provider when there was nothing, and he's also my provider now that I actually have money in the bank, you know? It's proverbial, if you look at it, to learn how to live in the day of little and in the day of much, like Paul, to learn how to live, to be content with nothing and content with much. And so I would say as we move towards these dreams, this vision, and we begin putting the building blocks together, we're made to enjoy building things. I love building songs. I also love building a business. I like that I get to provide for people and have salaries and teammates and that this thing has grown beyond just me. We're made to enjoy building something, you know? But it crosses a threshold into a time when it's actually working. And there comes a new temptation, a new crisis, if you will. How do you now navigate with the weight that you've been given? How do you hold that honorably and not implode? If you've not been building your strength in the day of small things, your legs will buckle because chances are you've given into a temptation for quick success. That's my opinion. I think it's scriptural. Bow down to me now and all this will be yours. That's right, you know. He knew what he had to do to hold the glory that he was destined for. He knew the world would be his. My dreams aren't small. Like I said, what keeps me going is realizing in this hunt for sound, there could be a song that brings change to entire nations. Christ knew what he was supposed to do. And at the moment of crisis, he was given the ultimate temptation. Bow down to me now and all of this could be yours. The very thing he was going towards. Lordship of the world. <laughs> you know? But then he enters in the correct way the correct way, through service and sacrifice, obedience to the ultimate call and the ultimate vision, and then he has the strength to carry everything. So I feel like for me, this last five years has been learning to carry the things that were hoped for and not give way to my delinquent 17-year-old sort of poverty mentality, which is like, oh my God, like, how am I gonna hold this? Like, when's the, one of the legs gonna get torn out from underneath me? I don't know how this is even working, you know? But to realize, no, you are my provider in the days of little, you're my provider now. I got a couple minutes. Interestingly, just this one last thought. Um, I like reading the biographies of like, I guess you'd call them great saints. Lately, I've been camped out in like late 1800s reading about D.L. Moody and Hudson Taylor and A.B. Simpson and Samuel Logan Bringle. And some of you will know these names, some of you won't, but they all have been part of great movements. They carried much, they affected millions. What's interesting is every one of them had a point in their life where they were already a significant way into their story, a significant way into their ministry, were already carrying huge loads, had already accomplished, worldly speaking, um, something to be proud of. And it was at that point that crisis found them in some way, shape, or form. Sometimes it was through health. Sometimes it was just through total dissatisfaction that I worked real hard to get here, but if I have to work hard to maintain this, I'm done. This, I thought I wanted this, I don't want this. And these are guys just doing ministry. You know, think about the guys leading big businesses or whatever. There, there are points where you reach that you're like, this is a success, I hate this, you know? <laughs> these guys all reached that point. And it was at that point they moved through the threshold, and this is where the preacher in me is gonna come out where they partnered with Christ and they said, no longer I, but Christ who lives in me. And they went on, there's different names for this. Many call it the exchanged life. It's the full surrender. And there is something about fully letting go and trusting him 
And I know that sounds real flowery, but it's a real thing. And I think the point where you're actually holding some success is a very important point in you ultimately being able to carry the glory that you're destined for. To be able to partner with him and say, okay, no longer in my strength. If I'm gonna move forward from this point, it's got to be in your strength that we're not doing this any longer. And so I will say that's been the season that I have been in. I can't say that I'm like up and out of it. Maybe this is the rest of my life like this, driving around for eight hours like, <laughs> you know? But that time is doing something to me and I've accomplished more with less in that time than I did before. So if, if that testimony even helps you, um, that's all the time I have. So God bless you guys. Yeah. Thank you.